Hello and welcome to The Green Room by Deloitte, an award-winning podcast where we explore the topics that matter most in business. I'm Ethan Worth, and this is episode number 57, where we ask, what makes you feel like you belong? Black entrepreneurs are over-mentored and underfunded. I think mean, don't go into a situation thinking, I don't belong here. You may not feel that you belong, but you shouldn't feel like you should be excluded. For me, in the simplest of terms, belonging just means a safe space truly be my authentic self. I actually have earned my right to be here as opposed to you have allowed me to be part of your team and part of your world. I think today's first order of business is to welcome Annie. This is our first episode together. How are you? How are you feeling? Thanks, Ethan. I'm feeling good. Very happy to be on the sofa with you today. And today in support of Black History Month, we have a really important topic that I think will resonate with lots of our listeners and it's all about belonging. Um, And we've all yearned for it, whether that's at school, at work, in the gym, with our friends, but sometimes we just settle for fitting in rather than truly belonging. And I think that's that's particularly true for black people in white dominated spaces. Um, And so to shed some light on that, we've got two fantastic guests and if you could introduce them for us, please. This week, we're joined by Justice Williams, MBE, who is a multi-award winning personal brand strategist, business coach, and corporate trainer, and the co-founder and editor-in-chief of The Black Business Magazine. Welcome, Justice. Thank you. And we're joined by Joss Graham, a director in Deloitte's consulting practice and the technology sourcing and commercial management lead. Josh is also the co-founder of Deloitte's Black Network. Welcome, Josh. Welcome. Thank you. So welcome to you both. We're so delighted to have you here. To get us started on the big question of today, which is what makes you feel like you belong? We'll start off with this concept of belonging and Justice, I'll come to you first. What does belonging mean to you? I guess for me, in the simplest of terms, belonging just means a safe space, truly be my authentic self. Great definition. Josh, what about you? I think I'd probably echo the point around um, being your authentic self. Uh, I think to me, it's it's feeling like you have license to be somewhere and feeling like you have license to participate. Um, I think you can be in and among a lot of people and not necessarily feel like you belong, you're just present. Um, so for me, it, it is that ability to go, I personally feel like I have the ability and the license to speak up, to talk, to get involved, to make decisions, to impact the environment around me. And you both have these really successful careers. So Justice, you, um, I think you won Cosmopolitan's Most Inspirational Woman. I think you were the youngest black woman to win, to be awarded an MBE. And Josh, obviously, you've done great things for the firm, director at Deloitte. Um, recognized by the MCA for your work in kind of pioneering work in inclusion. But has there been times and, and maybe even still today where you where you don't feel like you belong in the world that you that you operate in? I would say definitely. When I first started, believe it or not, I know I look young, it was pre social media. Social media didn't exist and the only way you could get your voice out there and amplify the work that you were doing would be to get in front of the press, attend in real life at meetings, there was no Zoom or anything like that. And I didn't feel like I belonged in many spaces because I was often the youngest. I was often the only female and I was often the only black female. And also I had blonde hair as well. So I did stand out. Um, But also my mentor did say to me, and says, just sometimes use that as your superpower. Don't always look at your differences as something that is a weakness. Often I, I did feel that I didn't belong in certain spaces. And it's one of the reasons why I started to create spaces from a young age so that I could make other people feel like they belonged. That's amazing. And that, that reframing it of a superpower is is really powerful, but must have taken a lot of like mental strength, especially at that age. Definitely. I think mentorship really helped uh, and finding people who supported me and having that safe space where I could actually be my authentic self really helped. And And I always say, if you see something and you don't like it, then do your best to change it. And sometimes we have to be the first. And Josh, did you kind of have a, a similar experience coming up through the firm? And I mean, I, I wasn't nominated for an MBE, so slightly <laughs> different. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, I've been at a firm for, I think, 12 years and two weeks, something like that, not that I'm counting. Um, and, you know, throughout that time, I think there have been periods where I've not felt like I belonged. And it might not be because I'm a black individual. It could just be I feel like I'm underqualified to be in a certain room or that I just don't know a group of people who tend to work together and I'm sort of the person brought in and maybe as an expert on the topic but then even just from a friendship clique perspective 
you know, you, you don't you don't have the context of all their back to their jokes or anything like that. Um, so I think it it's common to feel like you don't belong. Um, I think for me, it's just that what can I do to try and change that? And sometimes what's on other people to do to either make me feel welcome? Are there barriers I'm putting in place where in my head I think I don't belong here, but I do. And it's just imposter syndrome kind of taking over a little bit. Justice, you mentioned you've made a real effort to create spaces for other people to belong as well, you know, particularly young people. And Josh, as well, your point around it being on you versus it being on other people. When you have created those spaces or you found yourself in those spaces where you did feel like you could bring your full self to those spaces and you really felt like you did belong, what what did that feel like to feel seen? It just feels comfortable because I think that, you know, it's everybody's dream just to be their authentic self. And I feel for myself, take an unconventional route of not going down the degree, what my, um, down the route my father wanted me to do. I got a place at university, studied law and politics, didn't pursue that. Got into the media, got into, in, into entrepreneurship, even though he was an entrepreneur himself, he wanted us all to go down the kind of professional route. For me, it was just a case of doing the things that I love and also at the same time, understanding that I had a responsibility to actually create change. And when I, when I, when I got my MBE, I always said, it's of service to, so therefore I will always be of service. And so every aspect of the work that I do, I always look at a way of creating a space for people to feel safe and to be their authentic self. Because for me, creating these spaces is really really important and the onus doesn't have to always be on other people and so I feel that I have that responsibility on my shoulders and it just feels amazing that I've been in spaces growing up where I didn't feel that I belonged and so I didn't want to always be the only woman in the room or the only non-white person and so when I was winning my awards I got my Cosmopolitan magazine award the next year I got a red magazine award I went to 10 Downing Street three times in in 18 months I've been invited to speak at the House of Commons twice. I thought, you know what? I'm going to create my own awards. I'm going to create my own events. I'm going to create my own spaces because I know what it feels like to belong and I want to create that experience for others. And Josh, you've obviously also been a catalyst behind creating some of these spaces within Deloitte. I think there's the, the Black Network and the Black Action Plan. Could you speak a bit about kind of how those came about? If we go back to... 2019 um there was an event held by the byp so the black young professionals uh, organization it was a leadership conference uh, a few of us got tickets we asked the firm if they'd fund a large portion for us to go um so i think we ended up with probably about 20 black individuals from deloitte uh, attending this event um and i mean it sounds odd because this would be what eight nine years into my career at the firm that was probably the most black people from Deloitte I'd seen in one space. Wow. And so I think we all kind of reverted into your point about being comfortable. It was just easier. You know, there's a lot of effort and there's a lot of energy in trying to maintain a certain persona and hold back certain things and whether it's your dialect or how you, how you, you know, how you communicate. And being around all of those, being around others like you, not necessarily from the same place, right? You know, black people can be from Africa, from, from, from the Caribbean, from where else. But just being like you didn't have to pretend or hold something back uh, was, was kind of really refreshing. So the view was, let's catch up more. Let's, you know, now, now we know each other. Let's try and see each other again. A WhatsApp group was created. It was, again, 20 of us. Um, and I think that lasted about a year and, until sort of July 2020, where you had sort of the, the incident with George Floyd and, and, and all the activity after it. Um, and as part of what we did at the firm, and I think when we were, when I was asked to sort of help write the Black Action Plan, the view as well, one, we need to try and change everything. It was a bit of a, well, whilst we have focus and whilst we have, let's be honest, budget and, and people's attention, let's think of everything that we can think of within the firm that we think might might benefit from initiatives and from a, a, a review of whether it's, um, you know, equitable for, for, for black people. Um, and the other half as well, we probably should have a proper network. You know, this WhatsApp group is great. We arranged events through it. People ask in advice, but it's still informed when it still didn't have a budget for anything it didn't have any sort of impact or, or voice within within the firm um so you know october 2020 we launched the the, the black network i think to 200 odd people uh, i think we're probably now near a thousand um that doesn't cover all black people in the firm so i think we've still got work to do to to reach those that that we've not yet um connected with um but effectively it was you know very much grassroots 
I think we used the the you know the movement around you know from from George Floyd to really drive change and and build a community that kind of was official and you know had the backing had the official backing of the firm and um, was officially recognised and we've sort of just tried to grow from there really. Yeah. No, and you and you touched on kind of that point around not having to have different personas and feeling a bit more comfortable. Mm-hmm. And and in preparation for this podcast, I did a bit of reading about kind of code switching and and the the cost of that, both kind of psychologically and also through kind of missed talent in the workplace. Is, is that something that you you've experienced in terms of that bringing different parts of yourself um, to work at different points? And and is it something that you've kind of grown more comfortable with throughout your career or something that you you feel like you're still still having to do well I consider myself unemployable so it's good for me because I work for myself so I think by the time I was 21 I had 21 jobs and I just did it if I didn't feel comfortable in the space I would just leave it's mainly the work I just feel that I was born to be an entrepreneur and so for me the greatest thing about that is being myself sometimes people meet me and they say oh you're very well spoken or you're very articulate which I find offensive because, you know, black people can be articulate and we can be well-spoken. I grew up predominantly in a white, middle-class, suburban area of Birmingham. We were only one of three black families and, you know, we were all quite close. And so for us to get that rich cultural experience, we used to have to travel to the inner city for carnival, for cultural events, African Liberation Day and Black History Month stuff. And so although all my friends were white up until I got to probably year 10, at school, I was just comfortable being myself because that was just how I kind of grew up. My dad raised us to be well-spoken anyway. It wasn't a thing about you need to fit in. In fact, he was very much like, be yourself. You're black, you're proud, you're a woman. And so I didn't necessarily experience that, but I do hear a lot of friends go through that and they do find it very, very mentally exhausting and very, very challenging. And I would say the only thing that I kind of held back was that pre-George Floyd, if I wanted to speak out about a lot of issues, especially like Twitter, I was quite active on Twitter at the time, not so much now for multiple reasons. Um, X now. Yeah, <laughs> X, exactly. There you go. Can't keep up. You know, I would have this, oh, you're angry and you're aggressive and you're, you know, we had this, this thing of this black woman being, you know, strong and having a chip on her shoulder. And it's very sad to say that the tragic events of 2020 kind of gave us a voice and allowed us to start to speak up. And so that's, I think, my closest experience of, of code switching. Mm. And that, that point you made around like being articulate, being a bit offensive, because in our previous episode that we recorded about a year ago now, we spoke to uh, someone called Sandra Kerr uh, and her maiden name is Sandra Lennon. And she used to say that um, she would show up somewhere and people would be surprised because yeah. the name didn't sound necessarily like she was a black yeah. woman. And she might not have spoken like how they expected. And her kind of getting a bit of a kick out of that actually but also really what's coded there is is really quite yeah. offensive and racist yeah. definitely because i think there's a little bit of a misconception that as you get more senior or more well known publicly you're more protected from certain treatment or certain parts of discrimination and i don't think that's true but would you say that your sense of belonging has changed over your career at deloitte it's a good question so i think I think there was a point, um, I can't remember exactly many years ago, but where I was asked, I was going through a promotion uh, and as part of that, they were trying to get me to think about who would I seen that I wanted to try and emulate and, you know, and, and to kind of help me go, right, okay, I need to focus on that and that would be my goal. And they raised the question of, well, so who, who are your role models? They just asked me, it was an instant question. It was, it was a useful question as part of helping coach me in what I was, what I was doing at the time and sort of paused to sat there. No one came to mind. And that wasn't because I don't respect people. And there are many people that are more senior to me today who I, you know, I owe my career to and, and I've tried to learn bits and pieces from them, but I didn't have anyone that I could look at and say, I'm like them, they did it so I can do it. Um, and I think that the reason I bring that up is it's, that's what made me realize I need to be that person for others. If I didn't have it and I managed to get where I have done through I don't know I'm I'm relatively friendly. Um, I mean, I grew up in Britain, so I think there's a there's a level of cultural understanding that I just have inherently from growing up in London. And and but I thought, well, there are others that may not have that, and I need to be a bit of a model. So I think from a sense of belonging, it almost was a I know I deserve to be here because I've done the work. 
I've put in the work, I've, I've done my promotion, I've delivered on the projects that I'm working on, and I actually have earned my right to be here as opposed to you have allowed me to be part of your team and part of your world. Um, and I think having that in my head, and part of that is just purely on, on me, right? That's on me going, you know what, I think I, I, I deserve to be here, I deserve to have the grade that I have. Again, gave me a license to go, well, actually, I can be more of myself now than I could before because I need others to see that I am being myself because otherwise they may not feel like they can do the same. So it it's partly a, I maybe feel like I belong more because I'm more senior and, you know, I've gone through the panels and the promotion processes to approve it, but also a sense from, from my own personal being saying, well, I I want to belong, I deserve to be here and I need to belong so others can feel like they, they can as well. In that role model point, it's, it's really interesting. Do you, do you feel that, although it's really important to be a role model, I feel like you both probably have a lot of expectations in your jobs anyway, let alone having the kind of expectations of then feeling like you need to reflect a whole community of people and that, that you that you, you don't want to mess up so it doesn't kind of people doesn't reflect badly on that community or the the weight of expectation of being a role model. Is that is that something that you, you experience? I would definitely say yes. I think that when I got my MBE, I was young, I was twenty eight and a lot of people wanted to give me advice, like, you know, you can't go here, you can't be seen there, you can't be with those type of people because, you know, you've got an MBE now, you've got to be in these circles. I'm like, I'm the same person. Like, I didn't ask for an MBE. It was something that was bestowed upon me. I didn't apply for it. Till this day, I don't know who nominated me for it. And it's been, I think, what, 15 years now? And so there is that expectation. And I feel that, like, for me, I work with a lot of women and I encourage them to fail forward, make mistakes and do all these things. And sometimes I feel that I can't do that because people are looking at me in a certain way. And, you know, as you actually go further, you are actually more protected. You're more exposed, I feel because people feel that they have an opinion, if you're a public figure as well, an opinion on your life or the things that you do or the place that you go or the people that you speak to. Um, as you have now with social media, everyone has opinion on everybody. When I grew up, there was no women role models outside of my mom who I could turn to. My first two mentors that really guided me to where I am today were both men. And the role models I looked at were actually in America because I couldn't find any successful black women who were entrepreneurs in the early 2000s that would say, yes, I want to be like them. It was like the likes of Oprah Winfrey in, you know, America. And so, yeah, so I feel that we do have that expectation on us, but it is hard, uh, but it's something that the more that we can create more positive role models in all aspects of life, you know, I always say it's, it's lonely at the top. I need more people that look like me here. Yeah, I don't want to just be the, the one, the one here with that responsibility on my shoulders. Did you know, at Deloitte, we support social enterprises through our 5 Million Futures programme. Like Change Please, they use 100% of the profits from their award-winning coffee to help people experiencing homelessness. They offer training, employment and ongoing support with housing, finances and therapy. Why not sign up to the Change Please Coffee Club to receive weekly deliveries of coffee beans? Or try out one of their blends. Just head to changeplease.org. Now, back to our topic of the day. So, Justice, I, along with our listeners, I'm sure, would love to hear more about the Black Business magazine, how it all started, what some highlights for you have been, and your experience coming into those spaces as a Black woman and saying you're here for, you know, Black female entrepreneurs. How did that help with the creation of the magazine? So 15 years ago, I actually started a magazine, no experience, but it was based off my experience of working with young people. And it was a magazine to promote positive role models of young people in the media. And so that lasted probably about 12 months. And then quite a few years ago, I wanted actually to do another magazine and it was actually aimed at women because that's my primary target audience. And then during 2020, with all the tragedy that took place and with Black Lives Matter, I told you the idea of starting a magazine and both my friend, we had a conversation. But at the time we were both parents, we were both homeschooling. I was finishing up my degree full time at home, had a toddler and running a business and it just wasn't gonna happen. I then got involved in a network called The Black Owned Economy on Facebook and I was one of the founding members and we grew the group from 3,000 members to 150,000 black owned businesses with 80% of them being in the UK. We got picked up by Facebook, now Meta, and we invited to be part of the Facebook Community Accelerator and I was a lead representing the community on that and we did a few activations 
and they they funded us to do do some work and once that ended I thought I was like we've got to do more we've got to do more to be more visible we told you the idea of a podcast but we thought you know what what's tangible that kind of stands the test of time will be a magazine and surprisingly there is no black business magazine in the UK and there has never been one and so for us it was a case that we've got the voice newspaper which is a great newspaper which was like a great inspiration and so we decided to to, to find, found the magazine we are quarterly in print but also digital we do a very short print run it is sustainable print on fsc paper and we encourage people to obviously get a digital subscription but it was to create more visible role models and if you look at business publications they are actually heavily related and aimed at men and you mainly will f- see men featured. If you think about Forbes and a lot of the business publications that exist. And so for me, being the editor-in-chief and being a black woman, I could bring that balance in terms of, of stories. You know, and my, my good friend, who I call my business bestie, Dr. True Powell, he's a co-founder and he's the CEO. He's great with partnerships and kind of working with brands and, and amplifying the voices of people in business. So we work really, really well together in terms of our strengths. And so the magazine was formed, but we see it as like the shop window. And so it's not just a magazine. We'll be doing quarterly events. We will be also launching a podcast. We're going to be doing some business support programs and a whole range of other things throughout 2024 and beyond. Oh, sounds amazing. What's What's been one highlight for you so far? For me, it's about meeting people who I didn't even know existed. And so the front cover of our first edition, the theme was Midlands Entrepreneurs Shaping the Future. And one thing that research has shown is that black businesses have no problem in starting up. They're three times more likely to start up than their white counterpart, but they struggle to scale beyond the six figures. And so what we wanted to do is actually create a platform where we could show visible role models. Every single one of those seven people on the front cover are at multiple six, seven or eight figures in terms of their video, in terms of their business. So like Byron Dixon OB, his company turns over a million pounds, 10 million pounds, sorry. And he's global, he's all over the world, China and Far East uh, and so forth. And so it was about encouraging people to show people actually this is possible, but inspiration alone is not going to take people there. So we want to also provide information, practical advice, knowledge and actionable tips that they can implement in their business. And Josh, we we spoke about kind of the, the Black Network and the Black Action Plan. Um, what are some of the kind of results that you've been seeing there? How is how is that um, how is that landing now in the firm two years on? Good question. So I think you know the the, the plan launched three years ago. Um, I think it was highly ambitious and, and and relatively comprehensive in in what it what it proposed and what it what it set out. I'd, I'd say there's mixed results, and I think that's to be expected. To be honest, um, I think the I want to say the most, it's, it's the least tangible, but it's the change I've noticed the most is just an openness to conversation. So I do find that on a day, and this is more something you can only take from anecdotal, you know, feedback and, and, and from our own uh, experiences, but there are a lot more conversations as to, we want to do X. Is there anything we need to think about? Or, or before we do this, should we think about so and so forth? And, and that could be, you know, to make things more inclusive or to make sure that they're thinking about the cultural context of, of any particular item or, or communication, for example. So I think whilst that wasn't something being written down in the plan, I do think that's been one of the biggest, biggest changes. Um, outside of that, I think what I've seen the biggest change, you know, we, and, and for context, you know, we looked at things, well, we proposed things like looking at how we do our talent reviews and, you know, to the point around angry black women are we unfairly judging people based on what actually is a cultural learning, but we see it as a failure or as some sort of poor performance? People who are quiet because they are, they tend to give more respect to senior or you know uh, more uh, promoted people. Um, we looked at whether there was you know pay and how that was what that would look like, pipeline for recruitment um, externally who we work with, uh, what our DNI clauses are within our contracts. So there was a lot with clients, so there's a lot of stuff that we looked at. Um, I think numbers wise, I can't really talk to them, but I think they've improved slightly, probably not where we want them to be. So there's still a lot of work going on. Um, I know that we've changed how we recruit, um, and removed some of the barriers that I think we saw, um, were sort of limiting or kind of hindering those of, of, of black, uh, black heritage. So having case studies at the end of, 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 of interviews, which realistically, if you come from a background where your family work in business, 
you will have a better sense of how business is structured. You can talk about a procurement function and a finance function where none of my family works in you know organizations like that. So I wouldn't have, I'd have no idea to even think about those things going into interviews. Um, so you know some changes. There is still a long way to go, um, and then that's, that's not to discredit the work that people have done, but it's just you know it's a it's a huge organization uh, and, and change takes time. I think your point around what are you role modeling and just as your point around being authentic and being yourself do you feel like there's a conflict with you know celebrating differences and being authentic and this sense of belonging and do you feel like highlighting people's differences does good work to foster a sense of belonging or do you think it runs the risk of alienating people further that's an interesting question uh for me i would say that highlighting people's differences and celebrating people's differences is very very important you know i'm tired of people saying oh i don't see race we all bleed the same but you know it's very important to recognize our differences because with our differences also come privilege opportunity and equally challenges and barriers and that's kind of like the key differences between equality and equity and so for me it is important because when you're actually recognising people's differences, you can create safe spaces where people feel that they belong. However, belonging is just not based on characteristics because I'm black or if I'm from the LGBTQ community, I'm neurodiverse or I'm a parent. Sometimes it's about our values. And so even like with my role models, some of my role models are not black women who I follow, who coach me, who mentor me, but we have shared values or we have shared similarities. And they are 10 steps or 10 years down the road of where I want to be in terms of lifestyle, in terms of some of the goals and some of the dreams that I have. So I think it's really important that we create those spaces, but also those spaces can also welcome people who don't necessarily have those shared characteristics or shared values, because until we have those spaces, how do we learn from each other? How do we start to feel comfortable being alongside other people who don't necessarily look from like us or come from backgrounds like us. And I think it's a two-way street. We, we can all learn. And so I think it's definitely important to have those spaces and celebrate people's differences because otherwise people feel that they're not being seen, they're not being heard. And it's really important to amplify people's voices. But equally, we can all be a part of those spaces because we can find shared characteristics and shared values, even if we're different. We can also be the same. What about you, Josh? Do you feel like we'll ever get to a point where we don't need a black network or a multicultural network or our proud network? Or do you feel like those spaces should always exist for whoever needs them? Not not in my lifetime. Um, and I don't think that means that... With, I don't like it about my lifetime, but I don't think that means we um, won't get to a point where you know inclusion is at the forefront, where it is a lot better... I think just to your point around those safe spaces are still just good for people of a common group to to celebrate, you know, and to fill apart something, you know. It, it and I don't mean to demean it, but it's the same as you know you have sports teams and their fans. It's they're not there because they have any other specific shared interests outside of the sport or the the, the team. So I, I think having those networks there, I think they'll they'll always be around at least for short term. Um, I don't think that networks are it's their job to drive inclusion i think it's their job to help people feel like they belong and to help people find connection and meaning but i don't think it's it's an organizational change that needs to happen to drive inclusion um and i, I think in, in terms of the, the point you raised on you know if you have pe- if, if you want to try and drive inclusion and you start bringing out people's differences does that stop belonging if people are somewhere for a shared purpose they don't need to be similar in other elements right. You know, I'm, I work with a team where none of us are from the same background, but we're not there talking about our differences from an ethnicity background perspective. We're talking on right. We have work to do with our client. We all have similar expertise. What can we learn from each other? How can we deliver on what we've been asked to do? So, I think calling it out is great because people do have differences. People are different and have different viewpoints, different thought processes, different sets of experiences. Um, but it's it's valuing those differences using them for, for, for purpose and for a reason um, as opposed to I think pushing it down because it's an easier conversation to not have to worry about it um, so I think yeah 
not calling them out is easier. Calling them out and celebrating them and, and acknowledging them is better. You made a, a, a really interesting point that we didn't really touch on earlier around this this angry black woman stereotype. Um, and I, I read about a study where I think um, people were showing different clips of uh, a customer service agent and uh, there were different uh, people, some black women, some black men, some white women, white men, and, and the participants in the study who were making the judgments were from all different backgrounds as well. And consistently across the board, it was black women, um, not even black men, just specifically black women that were were, were um, kind of marked down as having some internal characteristic that made them angry, even though the script was the same, whereas the other people got the license of, oh, the situation was making them angry. Um, and and I guess that just made me think about this kind of intersectionality point and that idea of not only are you black, but you're also a woman. And then there might be kind of like you might be black and LGBTQ. Um, do you think it's important to think about how those different aspects of your character come together, how there needs to be safe spaces that, that integrate those parts of yourself? So important, definitely for me. I get invited to speak around black business, black community stuff a lot. And I have to re iterate the fact we are not a monolith we are very intersectional for example i remember when i was growing up and i said oh, we're going on the holidays to the caribbean and everyone's like oh you're going to jamaica no we're not actually from jamaica from the eastern caribbean we're from Sankit. yes i love jerk chicken and, and, and reggae music but it's about understanding that and also as well people who derive from the caribbean have different cultural differences to people that come here from africa and so it's about understanding that actually there are different challenges and barriers sometimes through that intersectionality. And so for me, I always say to people, you know, they bring me around to help, says, oh, you know, you'd be great to get part of this network for black business. And I says, I just want to make it clear. I'm, I'm happy to contribute to the conversation, but I want to be here to actually speak on behalf of black women and represent black women. If that's something that you want to actually focus on within this, that's great because we have to recognize that there is different perspectives. And then also being a parent as well, there comes so much challenges. And going back to that point about that angry black woman, you know, black women are four times more likely to die in childbirth than white women in the UK. And that's because they're not getting the support, they're not getting the help that they need. And also as well, when they're being vocal and asking, saying, I'm in pain or something's not right, you're being loud, you're being aggressive. And that's why they talk a lot about the, the, the fragile white tears of white women. It's a case of recognising that actually there are differences, you know, between, you know, like you says, between how people identify, um, um, sexuality, disability, ability, and all the religion and all these things as well. And so it's important to actually keep these um, at the top of the conversation as well. And do you think there's still quite a, a good amount of momentum behind it? Because from my kind of anecdotal experience there was a lot of focus in 2020 and it and it's it is still i think Deloitte's doing quite a good job of still kind of recapping and 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 refreshing to the wider business but the momentum feels slightly slower but i guess that's probably natural with something like this but do, do you think mate yeah the momentum is slowed i think always fair <laughs> yeah. to say i think we expected it you know we yeah. like, like i said we we capitalized on the fact that there was a huge amount of attention on, on black equality and we thought right whilst their eyes are on it whilst every firm wants to do something about it let's write some things for them to do uh, and we had always anticipated that there'll be a point at which there is another crisis or another focus that rightly so there should be an attention put on it so we thought well, okay well how can we get things up and running so that we can if the attention and the budget and the, the focus and the mind space shifts we it's still it's still running in the background um and we'd also we wrote it sort of with an intention of it being a bit of a blueprint so prior to the black action plan most inclusion initiatives tend to be very broad they go how can we be more inclusive in general how do we increase our overall and i don't like the term but our bame numbers you know it, it's collecting every single minority into one group and going how do we fix this as a problem and this was the first time we looked at it specifically just black individuals or people from black heritage as opposed to all ethnic minorities and the view was well if this works could you then replicate it and, and do things for yeah for, for other for other sort of um, underrepresented groups. So yeah, the momentum is slowed. I think we expected it. Um, my hope is that there are still enough people that want to drive it. Again, this is going to be a lot of people's side of desk work. Um, and, you know, Annie, you're, you're, you're one of them doing, doing, doing fighting the good fight. Um, and I think the view is there'll be enough people doing it, but we do need the organisation to 
put their force and might behind it because it can't be solved by the individual. It has to be solved by the by the kind of the collective. I always think that there's so much more organisations should be doing. And to your point, Justice, as well, around small businesses, like startups, black businesses, that don't necessarily struggle to get off the ground, but then they struggle to scale. Do you feel like there's more big organisations can be doing to support those businesses or more organisations need to be doing more generally within their own inclusion agendas? Most definitely. I was interviewing a black investment fund yesterday and he said a very profound statement. He goes, black entrepreneurs are over-mentored and underfunded. And that is statistically correct. It's like fact, you know, I've got to pull that out as, as a quote. Because in the last 10 years, when we look at VCs and venture capital funded in the UK, 0.2, less than 1%, 0.2% of venture capital funding went to black entrepreneurs. And out of that... 0.02% went to black women, which just goes to show you the disparity and the level of systemic change that we really need to make. And so we can start businesses, we have the skills, the capacities, but we need the support to scale and grow. But unfortunately, if there's people not like us sitting at the table making a decision about where the money goes and is invested, herein lies a problem. Because if they don't understand some of the cultural nuances and they have their own unconscious biases, which we all do have, then it's going to be very hard for certain groups to actually, you know, get the support that they need. And so there's a lot more that needs to be done. And it starts with the government. It starts with, you know, banks and larger organisations who have budgets, who have resources, who have the power to make these changes. Because like you says, often than not, it's left to us on the ground. And I, when I was invited to the House of Commons to speak, I made a very clear statement that says, look, and I look look young, but I'm in my forties, I've got two kids. Like I'm not gonna be here and be, always be that person. We need to actually put the onus on other people. I can't always be here, like, you know, with the whip and shouting the odds and having to, cause it is draining and it is that, that mental load that I have to carry as well to always be speaking on behalf of the black community. And again, I alone do not represent everybody within the black community. So there is a lot of work to be done slowly, but surely that's one of the things as well that we wanted to do with Black Business Magazine. On that belonging point, you know, if 0.02% of funding goes to black women, how can a black woman feel actually belong in the business world, right? If you're going, you have no agency, you have no ability to do what you need to do because your funds and your resources are so limited to that point of belonging and feeling like you have a license to operate within a space yeah they may have a unofficially they have license but in terms of actual ability and, and resources to do so it's not not non-existent almost exactly and they look around and see very few other black female-led businesses who are able to share that experience with them and, and help them create that space for belonging as well yeah and culturally as well it's different with the us and the uk they, they have a long way to go and there's a lot of racism and they've got their own issues to contend with, but there's also a lot more resources, a lot more organisations and systems and processes in place. We are quite behind, but globally, black women in the last two years have been the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs in the world, but we get the least amount of support and the least investment. I think this brings us round quite nicely to our, to our topic of day, all about belonging. And I know we've talked a lot about the kind of the collective and the, the responsibility of big business, of society. But but what's your advice to to the individuals who are who are yearning for belonging but haven't quite found it yet? I would say seek out those spaces. Don't be afraid to go and look for those spaces. Often than not, if we kind of stay still and we stay in our comfort zone, we it can be very very lonely. And sometimes we have to step outside of our comfort zone and seek out those spaces. And if you don't find those spaces, don't be afraid to create them as well. And so that's what I would say for those that are seeking to belong. Find people shared values and think about the elements of belonging that you're actually seeking and go and find those. You know, we've got the internet at our fingertips. So whether it's location based or if it's online, there's so many spaces that we can find. And if not, let's create, we can create our own. I will put it this way. There's very few places you don't belong. I think mean, don't go into a situation thinking, I don't belong here. You may not feel that you belong, but you shouldn't feel like you should be excluded. Mm. Um, and then I think it is a case of 
look for, I don't want to use the term role models given I've, what I've mentioned earlier, but you know, look for those that you can relate to or those that have, from what you can tell, a sense of belonging within a place, understand what they've done. Are those things you want to do as well? Don't, don't sacrifice your morals or kind of your personal identity if you don't want to, you know, yeah. it's, if, if you feel like you do, then maybe you, then you can say, I don't belong in this particular space. Um, but I do think to, to, to just his point, get out of your comfort zone, reach out to others, just go in with that kind of belief that you, you should belong somewhere. And I think when it comes to kind of creating spaces, role modeling, you two are clearly practicing what you preach. So right. thank you. <laughs> And I think we've probably covered it already, but just as is tradition, to summarize in one sentence, what makes you feel like you belong? Uh, question of the day. I think I'd go back to feeling like you have agency and the license to operate and change the environment that you're in. Yeah, definitely. I really like that. And also feeling safe to be your truly authentic self. What a great way to end it. Thank you both for joining us. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Green Room by Deloitte. We'll be back next time with another big question. This podcast is produced by our very own pod squad and hosted by George Parrott, Lizzie Elston, Ethan Worth and Annie Wong. Thanks to our creative studio for their technical support. Original music by Ali Barrett.